Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian with Simple Man's Comics here, and welcome to a new edition of the Hot and Cold Show, where we are covering the hot and cold market trends within the comic community. With me, as always, is my co-host, aka Mr. Bolo, Jack DeMeo himself. What's going on, buddy? Brian, I tell you what, excited to be here. It's new comic book day. How can you not be excited? And we are here to talk about back issues, not those new releases that we talk about on Thursday nights on the Bolo Show. We're talking about the hottest and coldest trends in the back issue comic book market. Right. And real quick, before we get into the list, it's important to let you guys know this video is brought to you from cbsiswag.com. If you guys want to get those CBSI shirts, hats, hoodies, they got beanies. It's starting to get cold out there. But make sure you head over to cbsiswag.com, use the code HOTCOLD10, and you get 10% off your order anytime. So make sure you head over there after the video, of course. With that being said, we're going to get right into the hot list, starting with our newest regular member here, who's also a Simple Man's Comics Patreon member, and also has his own YouTube channel, and we're talking about Comic Man Andy. Well, oh, that's the duck fart. Better than the bat signal. You know what time that means. It's hot cold show time. We gotta get a hot pick ready. Oh, we're running behind. We're a little late. I'm not prepared. Better get a game plan together. Oh. Let's get this hot pick going. Cooking like mama stew. All right. See what we got here for this week. Wait, pumpkin spice? Something's not right here. Area 51, Rabe. Uh, well, something's still not right. Popeye's chicken sandwich. Oh, that does sound good, though. Yoga pants? I can't complain with that. Wrong, cha wrong time, wrong channel, though. Try one more. White Claw. Well, no laws when drinking the claws. But, enough of that. Let's bring you my hot pick for this week. Betting on the bad guys. Seriously. Betting on villains is hot right now. Seriously. Everybody's specking on them. I got a long list to go through here. It did not used to be a thing 20 years ago. No. Right on the top of my list, Null. We're all kind of looking at Null. Dottie Case has got big things for him. This is going to be really cool to watch how this plays out. Evil Miles Morales, if you're not looking into that, you got to look into that. Omega Red, you know, right back somewhere above my head and I'm an idiot. Okay. Mysterio, Lady Deathstrike, Sandman, Craven the Hunter. Oh, man. Awesome chunk of Web of Spider-Man. Great read. If you haven't looked into that, you should. Mephestos. Thanos. Baron Zemo. Look out for that first appearance. That's great spec there, too. Doctor Doom. Joker. Magneto. The list goes on and on and on and on. It just wasn't a thing when we were kids to spec on villains. It is now a thing, and it is hot. It is so hot. I'm sitting here sweating just talking about it. Like, no joke. But the best villain? You guys know me. You guys know me by now, Punisher fan. Best villain out there, Kingpin. I always bet on Kingpin. He never loses. With that, peace out. Pinky's out. Catch you on the flip side, and I'll be back for my cold pick. There we have Andy talking about villain spec. A lot of times we've talked about before where, hey, villain spec isn't the best thing to talk on because you never know what's going to happen with it. But Andy brings us some great points. We are seeing some more attention given to villains right now. But what do you think about this, Jack? Well, yeah, Brian, you and I come from the old school where we were told to stay away from villain spec because villains are either, you know, the villain of the week or, you know, they're eventually going to die out in a movie no matter how big they are. But we're seeing villain spec become hot as fire on the market. So that's why this is a great pick because it's just there's no truer pick um, that you're going to find in the fact that villains are hot. But I think that this plays into two different categories. The first category being the fact that we're entering a new phase in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So everyone's speculating on who is that next villain. Um, we have a lot of talk about Doctor Doom or Galactus being that next big bad now that we know that the Fantastic Four are coming into play. There's a lot of talk about 
Omega Red, as Andy mentioned, and, and X Men number four. Um, since we know that the X Men are coming into play, there's also a lot of talk about Mister Sinister and Miss Sinister, with X Men coming into play in the MCU, as well as the popularity of Jonathan Hickman's House of X and Powers of X. And then that brings me into the publishing side. The fact of the matter is, villains are being created at a rapid rate, and more of them are being told. Um, these still more of these stories are being told. Um, where they're bringing these villains in kind of slowly and building the, the buzz and the kind of dynamic between villain and hero. Um, a lot of these villains are popping up, and to use a, a kind of a wrestling reference, I think it's because it's easier to create a heel than it is to create a babyface. If you're creating a hero or a babyface, um, you're trying to replicate or have somebody on the level of, say, a Spider-Man or Captain America or Thor. That's difficult. Um, you know, it takes time to build a character up to that level. But those characters have already fought all of their villains multiple times. And it gets to a point where you just don't want to see them fight the same person week in and week out. So we've got to constantly create new villains and new challenges for these characters. And that's why we've seen so many new villains pop up on the market recently who have captivated that this market. Um, and, you know, Andy mentioned some people like Gore. No, um, that evil Miles or Ultimatum, um, you know, just to name just to name a few, uh, Red Goblin. Um, when you think about the popularity that these characters have held, um, really upon inception onto the market, it has really far surpassed the uh, kind of past speculation on villains. And now we have like a whole new crop of villains who I think that Marvel's going to pay attention to, and may one day end up in the cinematic universe and get even more love than they're already getting. Right, so great pick from Andy. We're going to move right into the next pick on the hot list, and it comes from Covertoons author on comicbookinvest.com, Mike Morello. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's Covertoons with my hot pick for the week, and this week may seem a little bit like a homer pick from me. Uh, anyone that knows me knows that I have a fairly large affinity for this artist, but there's no denying the popularity right now of Jenny Frison. Um, most specifically with her independent variant covers, which are low printed, and her incentive covers. Um, obviously, right now, the really hot book that's on pretty much every hot list from here to the end of the earth is this Something is Killing the Children uh, number one variant, uh, which is super hot, selling like crazy. Uh, there's also a black and white version of this, which I think was a store exclusive, um, which was, I think, a $30 or $40 buy-in, which is selling for about twice that now. So if you can get your hands on that one, that's also a good one. Um, and it's also a really cool look into her style, since it's just the line drawing, which is how she works first, then she does the renderings after, so it's kind of a nice way to see both pieces of art if you have the the, uh, the line drawing version that's the store exclusive. But it kind of uh, really took off when this book came out about a month ago. It's this B-Lit number five. Actually, this might be about two months old, um, and this one really exploded. It was really tough to get. It was a one in 25 incentive, and let's face it, most stores were not ordering 25 copies of B-Lit, certainly not at number five anyway. Um, a beautiful cover, still hard to get and uh, kind of scarce to find. Um, there's also the uh, erotica variant that she did for Faithless. I'm going to show this sort of with the R rating covered up by my hand. Um, but this is a gorgeous cover. Um, and matter of fact, all of these covers, all of these erotica covers, I think are going to pop later. They're not worth a whole lot right now. Um, most stores knew what they were doing with those and ordered them pretty well, but they sold really well as well. I think they're going to get dry, and I think they're going to uh, go up eventually when uh, people realize really what they were. Um, but in turn, that is also helping her uh, older variants do well, especially her hack slash stuff. Books like this, which I think was the final book in the run. Be beautiful cover, really hard to find. Uh, there was this one, another beautiful cover that's also really low printed. There is also the Hack Slash My First Maniac number one variant, which has two printings. There's the grayer first printing and then the bluer second printing, both really tough to get uh, for less than 50 bucks. Matter of fact, they sell closer to 100 in most cases if they're in good shape with that dark cover. Um, and then there's also her first commissioned work, which is Hack Slash 14. Um, which leads me to the Piece de Resistance, which is this Voltron, which was her first published cover, um, a beautiful cover, very sought after by collectors. Uh, Voltron, a Legend Forge number one B cover. Some speculation about whether this was or wasn't an incentivized cover, but either way, really, really scarce cover, beautiful cover, um, and selling for north of $100 to $200 whenever you can find one. Um, so Jenny Frisson, still hot. Even her Wonder Woman covers are hot. 
Um, even though they don't sell for a premium, they still sell well. Um, I think most stores understand her popularity and they order appropriately. But um, there's no denying that she's a hot artist at the moment and continuing to get hot. Her books are going up and up and harder and harder to find, especially those rarer incentives and low print run indies. Thanks a lot, everybody. That's my hot pick. Have a great week. So this is a great pick. We got Mike Morello talking about Jenny Friesen, especially on those variants. He has some incentive variants on there. He has some regular variants. That something is killing the children. Definitely hot right now. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, yeah, I mean, this is no surprise to you and I, Brian. I mean, we've been talking Jenny Friesen on this channel since you and I linked up together. And we've constantly been talking about the fact that, and this is no slight to her, that she's like that B level of popularity on the secondary market. Meaning that, you know, when she does the right work, it blows up. But not everything she does inherently blows up. And we're starting to see her ascend into that A-level. We knew that this was possible. We talked about it. And it really reminds me of Adam Hughes. Um, Adam Hughes was a guy who was around for a while. Um, but then he had a moment where everything he did was just red hot. And when that happened, everybody went back into those back issue bins looking for those hard to find early incentive pieces that Hughes had done. And, you know, a lot of them were from... You know, his early days had smaller print runs. They were from maybe less popular books or smaller publishers. And because of that, we saw a lot of books skyrocket in value. And that's exactly what you're seeing with Frizen. Um, a lot of her early works, whether they're incentives or non incentives, I mean, because even like her work on like Red Sonia, some of those cover B variants, um, you know, they're not heavily available. Um, it's hard to find. And because of that, and because of the fact that she is being collected now uh, as like a, you know, collectors are collecting specifically her variants and they're trying to go back into her back issue catalog and acquire them, as well as speculators speculating on the fact that they think that these variants are going to rise. We're seeing more and more of these kind of obscure older Jenny Frizen releases from whether it's Image or Dynamite um, start to really blow up on the secondary market. And another one that comes to mind is some of her recent work with Boom Studios, uh, whether it's Something is Killing the Children or her Buffy the Vampire Slayer incentives and uh, regular cover, cover A's, they're starting to get more attention than they were getting. So I think this is a great pick. This doesn't surprise me. I think Jenny Frizz and the Star is only starting to rise. And I think if anybody was to be negative about this pick, they would reference her Wonder Woman run and say, well, those books aren't taking off. But I think that that's more indicative of the DC Cover B program as a whole. I think the Wonder Woman run is the reason that has gotten her exposure that she has at this point. Um, that's how most people know her from, is from that those killer Wonder Woman covers. And man, Brian, you can pick about four, five, ten of those and say, like, this cover has potential. I think it's only a matter of time. You and I are on record talking about that. It's only a matter of time before some of these cover Bs from DC start to take off. Right, and one that I didn't see Mike mention, but one to keep an eye out for is that Voltron Legend Forged number oh, yeah. one variant. That's the one that's the hot ticket item, especially for her, but make sure... That's one of her first works, I think, if not the first. Yep. So, great pick also. Mike Morello has that killer interview with Jenny Friesen right here on this channel. We will put a link to the description to that interview in the video as well. And our next hot pick this week is going to come from the usual suspects author and comic book invest.com, Peter Renna. What's going on, everybody? This is Peter Renner with my hot pick this week, which is Batman Long Halloween. Sorry, I don't have a book to show you tonight, but my DC cabinet's in the other room and I don't feel like digging in it. So uh, we're just going to have to go with it like this. But uh, ever since Kevin Smith started uh, spreading that rumor that Long Halloween might be the uh, subject matter for the Robert Pattinson Batman movie, uh, these books have been going off eBay. All the cheap copies have pretty much been scooped up now. If you want one, asking prices are around 50 bucks right now. Uh, a CGC 9.8 sold at Best Offer with a $300 ask not that long ago. And uh, sets are looking for like around 150 right now. Great, and most that are actually selling set-wise are more in the $80 to $90 range, but... You know, those are going, and uh, pretty soon only the high-priced ones will be left. So, uh, you know, do what you can. Trades are selling, random lots of random books are selling, uh, even random issues, for one reason or another, are asking and getting, like, 7 to $10, and then plus shipping for uh, just random issues number 7 and number 9 and whatnot. I guess people trying to fill out their runs. Dark Victory, which is the sequel to it, unfortunately, isn't really doing much on the uh, aftermarket right now. You can still get a whole set for, you know, probably about... 
you know, 10, 15 dollars actually, and then plus shipping, you might be in for 20 bucks and you get the whole set of uh, about 13, 14 issues. But uh, again, uh, I wasn't a firm believer in Robert Pattinson. I was very skeptical, but uh, then Clint Joslin put me on to uh, a movie on uh, Amazon Prime that I checked out. It was uh, called Good Time, and uh, he was really good in it. So if you haven't seen that, check that out. But I believe that he can pull off Batman. I do. I'm just... I'm, I believe in it. So hopefully this is where they go with uh, Batman Long Halloween. Get you a nice detective mystery. Show the detect the world's best detective doing what he does. Uh, get a lot of his rogues gallery out there. And I like the topic so much, I'm actually covering this for Usual Suspects on Friday. So I'm going to cover some of the first appearances uh, related to that storyline. And maybe even throw a couple of casting suggestions. Because I like to do so. So anyway, my hot pick this week, Batman Long Halloween. So Peter's talking about how Kevin Smith... Blah, blah, blah. So here we have Peter talking about how Kevin Smith broke that news about Pattinson. We thought it was going to be a Court of Owls type movie, but we're finding out that it might actually be a long Halloween, which is causing those books to spike. They're hot right now. I enjoyed this story back when it came out. What was it? 96, 97 time frame. Right. Either way, this is either way. This series is hot. Was it a 12 issue series? I believe 12 issue series. Yep. Yeah. So with that being said, it's hot, and what's your take on this, Jack? Well, I love this this story. Um, I feel like, Brian, you and I have talked about this series before, but you know, this is something that I think is perfect for an introductory movie for a new Batman and Robert Pattinson as Batman. Um, you know, we talk spoilers on this channel, so if you haven't read it, you definitely should read it, but we're going to talk a little spoilery here. But this is a great storyline that gives us a look at Batman right after year one. You know, so this comes in right after Frank Miller's year one. So rather than redoing an origin story, which I think we all get tired of seeing rebooted movies and new origin stories, this is a good kind of early story that gives us a young Batman, but still gives us something a little different. And here he's more of the detective, which is another thing that's exciting. I think we've all been wanting that detective Batman on the big screen. Um, Long Halloween follows a killer named Holiday who is killing uh, once a month um, on a holiday. Um, Batman is going around fighting his regular rogues gallery of villains in kind of every issue. One, one might be Scarecrow, one might be Joker, one might be Riddler. So we may see cameos of all of those characters in this movie. And as he's doing this, this character Holiday is killing off um, different people throughout the book. And he and Jim Gordon are trying to piece together who could this killer be? Well, spoiler alert, it's not one killer, it's three. Um, we're looking at Alberto Falcone, who, uh, of course, of the Falcone crime family, who first appears in issue number one. Uh, Gilda Dent, the um, the wife of Harvey Dent, um, it, it kills several, and as well as finally uh, Harvey Dent himself and Two Face becoming the final killer. Um, and that's the point: is this story tells the transformation of Harvey Dent from district attorney to the villain Two-Face. And he ends up being the overarching end-all, be-all villain in this story. Um, I think this is a great story. We've obviously seen the transformation of Har Harvey Dent into the Two-Face uh, at some point in, in Christopher Nolan's Batman, but I think that this is a a better kind of story to tell. I'll let Peter, with his uh, Usual Suspects article, give you all those detailed first appearances because – you know, I'm interested in reading that myself. I'm, I'm not really familiar with what first appearances Peter may be referencing. So I'm excited to read that. I, I suggest all of you read that on comicbookinvest.com. But I think as far as speculation in this set, I would be on the lookout for those issues 2 through 12. Issue number 1 is the one that's scorching. The rest of the issues, you know, they can still be found in dollar bins and in $3 and below type boxes. Piece those sets together as you can. Don't be afraid to buy those later issues. That's always worked for me with many series that are popular, whether it's Secret Wars, whether it's um, uh, Infinity Gauntlet. You know, you don't get hung up on, oh, they don't have issue number one. Grab whatever you can grab. You can always buy those issue number ones later. We know about the spec cycle. Once this news is a little bit older, the prices are dropped. Another thing to be on the lookout for is the fact that there is a Halloween Comic Fest edition for number one so if you want to do one of those discount sets where you've got two through 12 and then you've got that free issue for number one you can do that or there i could even see that halloween comic fest edition becoming a five to ten dollar book at some point if issue number one of this series continues to grow and become say a hundred dollar or more book um people will want this book any way they can kind of get it um another thing to keep an eye out for is batman 692 this is when this story gets canonized in the you know, the Batman um, 
you know, chronological kind of lore the, where it becomes, you know, important in a key part of Batman's story. So Batman 692, I could easily see becoming a book that then becomes a kind of a minor key as it relates to this movie. So I would say sell as a set. Be on the lookout for those later issues and uh, look out for Batman 692. And be sure to check out Peter Renner's article on comicbookinvest.com. I'm excited for this movie, Brian. I think if this ends up coming to be, this is one that I will actually be really hyped for. And I still think it doesn't cancel out the possibility of Court of Owls down the road. Right. I'm excited for it. And I'm not I'm not one of those ones that's upset that Pattinson got cast as Batman. As long as they don't make him sparkle, I'm good with it. But we're going to roll right into the next hot pick, which comes from Phil at Vintage Toys and Comics, all the way from Japan. Hey guys, this is Phil from Vintage Comics and Toys. I'm live from Japan. I wanted to share with you guys uh, a book that I've been seeing that's really hot at shows, Strange Tales 158, First Appearance of Living Tribunal. I've been seeing this book being um, hunted for at shows uh, yeah, ever since last year, between the $40, $60 range and mid-grade. A lot of people have been trying to get it at that price. However, that's not the case anymore. I've been seeing a slab 5.5 going for, I think, $230 recently, a 6.5 hitting around that range, and also an 8.5 hitting $550. I think it's a great book. Um, it's got that Moon Knight type of following. People are intrigued with the character, and uh, it's also a great cover as well, too. So I definitely would like to recommend that book. Also, don't forget about 157, which is the first cameo. One just went off for a record price of $416 uh, at a CGC 9.2. And I'm not sure if you all have seen Clint Jocelyn's piece on the one above all uh, from last year that gave a detail about the character. But it's a great book, double spec. You also have an alternate version of Adam Warlock becoming the Living Tribunal later in the comics. So I definitely great, think it's a great book. I recommend it. If you see it between $100, $150 and big, big grade, I, ho I would go ahead and jump on it. Thanks, guys. So there we have it, all the way from Japan. What do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, you know what? This is a pick I wasn't really familiar with this character. I remember reading Clint's article some time back, but... You know, this wasn't a character that, like, is a character I know everything about. But it's funny when you then you, you hear something and you start thinking, well, that makes sense. And then you go down those comic book rabbit holes. Well, I did that. So let me share with you what I see as the reason why this pick has some serious value to it. Now, of course, we're talking about the cameo in Strange Tales 157 or the first full appearance in Strange Tales 158. You know my stance. I don't, I don't like to get into that whole topic. But – Beyond that, those appearances, there's some other appearances of note. This character is a character who has multiple faces. We're talking about three faces, uh, equity, revenge, and necessity. Um, and each of these faces, they kind of have different purposes. And it, this, this character is the judge, jury, and executioner of all things in the Marvel Universe. These faces have to agree for the, for, um, the Living Tribunal to take action. And we really get that explanation and description, um, kind of an origin, in Silver Surfer, Volume 3, number 31. Um, so this is a dollar bin book. This is a book that can be found um, th if this character shows up in a movie at some point. This is going to be a book that could easily pop on the secondary market. Now, I said three faces, and some of you may be saying, but wait a minute, there's four faces. But that happens later. So the next book to pay attention to is She-Hulk, Volume 2, number 12. And that's the first appearance of that fourth face. Um, that face is mirror. And the, the key to that, that issue is this slogan, treat people how you want to be treated. So you're shining a mirror on a member of the Marvel Universe. Um, and so now that brings us to the total of the four faces. And that is an important issue that also, again, found in dollar bins. Also, you get an amazing Living Tribunal cover with that issue. Um, the next thing is, and Phil referenced this in his, his video, is Adam Warlock and the Infinity Watch. Now, talk about a book that's been in dollar bins for years. But Adam Warlock and the Infinity Watch, number one and number two, tell the story of after the Living Tribunal's demise, Adam Warlock taking over and taking control of that role. Um, now, the, the power of wielding the Infinity Gauntlet and being in control of it and making sure nobody uses all of the stones together, that does get to him. But... We know that Adam Warlock is coming. We've seen the cocoon in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. So I think that there's solid spec there. And again, we're talking about dollar issues. And finally, we're looking at Fantastic Four number 11. In this issue, the Fantastic Four are looking for the one above all. 
and they're who is the leader of the only person above the living tribunal and when they go through the door they end up finding out that it's actually jack kirby and there's a funny panel where jack kirby's like erasing something and it's actually erasing something on mr fantastic's face but i don't think we're gonna see this like tongue-in-cheek jack kirby reference although i think that stan lee would have been amazing to play that role unfortunately stan lee has passed so I think that there will be some other imagination of this character if we see this in the MCU. But I think that that could seriously play into the whole Living Tribunal story. But the thing is you got to start connecting the dots. We're talking Silver Surfer, She-Hulk, Adam Warlock, Fantastic Four, um, and of course Strange Tales being synonymous with Doctor Strange. What do all of these have in common? Well, they're all properties we know are going to be coming in phase five of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or at least we strongly believe. And because of all of those dots connecting, I really think that the Living Tribunal is a solid speculation play. And obviously there's some smart, smart speculators out there who are buying these books up, and that's why Phil's talking about these record-setting auction prices that are getting paid for Strange Tales 157 and 158. Another thing to remember is that the Doctor Strange movie is titled Multiverse of Madness, so we're going to get this multiverse, which again, plays right into the Living Tribunal. We're going to get really the explanation of how this all happens, we imagine, and really see what the multiverse is as far as the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think the Living Tribunal would play excellently into that. Another character that the Living Tribunal really kind of interacts with is he at some point has to end up judging the Beyonder, who we know first appears in Secret Wars number one. And there's a lot of speculation that that could be the next big Avengers crossover. So a lot of people are buying up those Secret Wars number one issues. So looking at that, this character connects with all of these other characters and seems like a pretty solid speculation play. And while those first appearances in the Silver Age may be expensive, maybe you don't want to take that as a risk, that $100 $150, there's plenty of dollar bin fodder for you to go digging, grab, and take that long-term risk. Again... We're talking about dollar issues. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen. But if you see people spending this kind of money on Strange Shells 157 and 158, it gives you an opportunity to piggyback off that spec with some good cheap spec plays. And you never know what could happen. So we got a lot of great information there from uh, Jack as well as Phil. And also make sure you check out Clint Johnson's article over there on comicbookinvest.com. We're going to roll right into the next hot pick, which comes from a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Yeah, so we're a little short on um, on pickers this week. So you know what? I had to throw my name into the hat because there's something I have to talk about. What is hotter on the market right now than absolute carnage? Now, you may say, well, you know, I thought we were talking back issues. Yeah, and you're right. And some of this involves new releases. Today is the release of Absolute Carnage 3. We see a lot of events playing out right now in the market, whether it's that classified Young Guns variant with that Hulk uh, Venom cover and that last page splash page reveal um, of Hulk and Venom uh, kind of bonding. But of course, that's going to pop off back issues, um, whether it's that Venomized Hulk uh, 1 in 50 variant, whether it's that uh, what if first appearance, um, whether it's the Funko Pop. We're going to start seeing some of that stuff start to rise because everything absolute carnage is hot right now everything that happens within the pages of absolute carnage or is speculated to happen within the pages of absolute carnage is moving books on the secondary market look at what has happened with sleeper the sleeper was already a popular character but as soon as even the whiff of sleeper showing up in this storyline shot up those first appearances especially that second print first appearance and now we have sleeper as a cat and what will that do and where will that go we don't know yet um, then there's Dylan. Look at Venom 79. People continue to speculate on this character. This is character is red hot. Um, one of the hottest organically kind of created characters we've seen in a number of years. And of course, maybe his partner, maybe his future nemesis, um, Normie Osborne, who, um, at one point was extremely popular with that amazing 798, uh, first appearance as Red Goblin. Um, he, he, everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen with him. And I think the death of Norman Osborn in this issue is probably going to spear on whatever we're going to see with Normie. And that's causing his back issues, Amazing Spider-Man 263, the first appearance of Normie um, in comics in general, 
to pop on the secondary market again. And that, that books have its moments. So, um, you know, this is a, a crossover event, unlike any that we've had in recent years. Um, almost every issue seems to reveal something. It's been twists and turns. It's been tough to predict. Even when you've gotten spoiler pages, um, the story has taken a different direction than what even the spoiler pages have led you to believe. Um, we've seen variants take off. We've seen characters like Scream um, come back into prominence. Um, we've seen things like, again, these new characters popping up, whether it's like the doppelganger Miles or the Demigoblin um, from issue number one. We are seeing back issue sell. We are seeing demand for upcoming new issues. And, you know, Brian asked me several weeks ago when we first started talking about this book if there was ever a when, – when was the last time that there was a miniseries or crossover series that like we were this excited for? And I had a hard time answering that. I had to think about it for a while. I said maybe Civil War, which seems you know like it has to be crazy because it's so long ago. But really when you look at it, like I really believe that. I don't think there has been a more um, captivating story that has not just taken readers by storm – um, not just taking collectors by storm, but speculators. And this has all three. This is a home run from Downey Cates and Ryan Stegman. And it absolutely belongs on the hot list because the series is hot. The tie-ins are hot. The variants are hot. The related back issues are hot. Everything related to this series is red hot. Right. I think there's no denying right now that anything mentioned in comics, especially in today's market, people are absolutely mentioning absolute carnage. And then you have the Venoms. Everything Donny Cates right now is hot. And that's going to wrap up our hot list for this week. But we're going to cool things down right now. And we're going to go right into the first pick of the cold list. And it comes from Comic Man Andy. Oh, hey. Welcome back, everybody. Just exercising. You know, it's the bearded wonder. Comic Man Andy. Getting my daily reps in. Uh, five, six, sixty. All right, I'm back with my cold pick this week. My cold pick is uh, the writer for DC, Tom King. Um, based on a lot of the stuff I'm reading online and seeing on YouTube is the community is not happy with the way his most recent comics have been going. And it even sounds like uh, I've seen some rumors on that they're going to end that, uh, take him off that run early. Um, instead of going to issue 100, I think they're going to pull it at 85 is what I was reading online from a couple months ago. Um... Yeah, so that's my cold pick for the week. Brian, Jack, remember, most important thing, Panky's out. Catch you guys on the flip side. So great pick from Andy. We're talking about Tom King. People love him or hate him, but either way, he's definitely cold right now, especially with that Batman run of his getting ready to end. I've always said I haven't hated his Batman run, but it has been inconsistent in my eyes. There's some titles, some of the issues I really like, and then some of them I just don't care. We talked about with the 77, 78 recently, but what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, yeah, I mean, I can't deny it. Everyone who watches this channel knows I'm a big Tom King fan. I really like most of all of his work, but at the same point, like, I'm not delusional. Um, I, I read the same things you're reading when I'm reading this Batman run. I think I think your review of it is perfect. It's inconsistent. Um, there's moments that I've liked, there's moments that I haven't, I was definitely let down by certain storylines, but my big disappointment with the fact that DC is caving to the public pressure over this series is when you're talking about art and writing is an art form, you have to let the artist do it the way that they intend on doing it, the way it's intended to be received. And Tom King had this hundred issue arc that he wanted to tell and we're cutting him off early and yeah, he's going to do finish it with Batman, Catwoman and that 12 issue kind of maxi series but it's still not the way kind of this should have been told and i sit and go well what if something in those issues those 12 issues or 14 issues that he would be able to finish post um batman 85 would have ended up changing everyone's perspective of the story like what if there was something that happened earlier happened to set up something that's gonna happen and um, so it's unfortunate that King is getting pulled early. We don't yet know who is going to replace him. Um, let us know in the comments who you would like to see replace him at uh, starting at Batman 86. And obviously, guys, Scott Snyder, that's an easy pick. Let's, let's, let's go outside the box. Let's hear your fantasy picks here. But I still think Tom King is an A-list writer. Um, I think that 
him in his Batman run has kind of like soiled his name with comic book collectors. And we're seeing that kind of fall out into some of his other series. Mr. Miracle is, is colder than it, it should be. Um, vision, his vision series is colder than it should be. Uh, his Grayson series, which is a series you and I love is ice cold. Um, but again, the great thing about the cold, this is it provides buying opportunities because I can make the argument that vision is something that should be paid attention to because that upcoming WandaVision show seems to be hinting towards the direction of Tom King's vision series, making uh, vision number one quite possibly a good spec play, especially if Viv vision possibly shows up. Um, the next thing is his Mr. Miracle run. Tom King is writing the upcoming New Gods movie. And there's no doubt in my mind he's going to pull from his own series in that modern Mr. Miracle run um, for that movie. And we've even seen the uh, director, Ava DeVegni, um tweet out that tagline from his series, Dark Side Is. So, again, I, I really think that those books could see their, their time again in the sun. And they're really cold right now compared to where they were sitting at just some time recently. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, uh, you know, he's down now, but I don't think he's down for the count. Right. So let us know in the comments. Do you think Tom King's Batman run is cold? And if you do, also click that thumbs up button for us. And we're going to go right into the next cold pick. And it comes from CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside YouTube channel, Brian McClay. What's up, everybody? Brian McClay from CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside. Here to give my pick this week. I have a cold pick this week. It is... The new 52 Batman run, the famed Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo run that everybody loved. Everybody that read it loved it. It was the book that everybody talked about at the month. What are we going to see next week? And the storylines in it were amazing. Some of the storylines were some of the best Batman storylines that you'll read. Um, and when we heard about Robert Pattinson being cast as Batman a few months ago, people started buzzing about Quarter Owls. Everybody thought we were going to see Quarter Owls on the big screen. Even, even myself, I was super stoked. We were hearing these rumors, and I didn't think that there was anything else that they could pick over Court of Owls. And unfortunately for myself and everybody that wanted to see a Court of Owls movie, uh, we're going to have to wait because news came last week about the Long Halloween, that they're going the Long Halloween route. And uh, so, unfortunately, we're not going to see Court of Owls. But that kind of got me thinking to go look at what the new 52 Batman stuff is doing. And I was absolutely surprised to see what, once was a thousand dollar book in the number one the first issue uh, variant the sketch cover a thousand dollar book easily was going for a hundred and twenty eight dollars there was a cbcs uh, 9.0 signed by capullo and snyder that went for a hundred and twenty eight dollars absolutely blew me away i was really bummed out that i didn't see it and didn't win it um but that got me kind of looking and for what once was a thousand dollar book, there's been sales below three hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, multiple sales at three fifty, three three hundred and below, one hundred twenty eight dollars. So, I I don't think it's a bad thing that this is a cold pick this week because I am actively searching for variants in this run. I'm actively searching for the for the one in one hundreds, the one in two hundreds. I think this is a perfect time to pick up these books, but it is on the cold side. You can, some of these prices I never thought I would see as low as they are. Uh, absolutely amazing series, though, so if you haven't read it, check it out. Make sure to check out Tales from the Flipside every Monday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and also check out the CBSI Hot 10 Breakdown Show every Friday night. Uh, big shout-out to Jack and Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it, brothers. So previous pick, we talked about Tom King. We talked about how great Scott Snyder's Batman run was. But we also are seeing those DC New 52 Batman issues are kind of low right now. They're on the cold. But this is one of those things where we always talk about great buying opportunities. There's a lot of great issues in there. A lot of great variants that you can get for cheap right now. No doubt. To me, Scott Snyder's one of my favorite Batman runs. I actually have the whole New 52 run in my PC but what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, this is a great pick. And, you know, it, again, it. I think Tom King was up against it having to follow up this run. But this run being cold is an example of just what happens with comics. Once you reboot a series, it's no longer the current series. It's not the series that people are talking about or paying attention definitely to. A, definitely an attention span type thing. Yes, exactly. Um, but there's a lot of spec here. 
There's a lot. Uh, you mentioned variants, and I think that's where a lot of people go, and I don't blame them. Um, uh, but for variants to get popular again, you need something to pop them off. But there's a lot that could happen here within cinematic world. Um, Court of Owls, just because they're not doing the movie right now, I still think that's more of a movie for down the road, um, more than it is like an introductory movie. So I still think that's a movie that has to be made. Um, Scott Snyder is too important to DC Comics. Um, I think that also, you know, the Court of Owls kind of reframed how Batman's relationship and Bruce Wayne's relationship with Gotham City is, his relationship with the villains and the villains' relationship with the series. Um, I also think Talon is great spec. And it's important to note that that Talon character was not only created by Scott Snyder, the Talon series was written by Scott Snyder. So whether you go with Talon number zero or Talon, or Batman number two, which does two different Talons, either way, I think that that character in some form or fashion is going to show up in the cinematic universe. I think that character is too dynamic, too exciting. Um, there's too many different places they can go with that character um, not to see it at some point. I think the first appearance of the Court of Owls is still an amazing speculation play. As, like I said, I think that, that we're going to see that at some point. I also want to bring up the uh, Joker storyline. Now, we, the Joker's been done every which way in movies, right? And it's always hard to, like, how can you top how the last actor played the Joker? Everybody said that about Heath Ledger, and now it looks like Joaquin Phoenix is about to kill it in this new Joker movie. Well, I think a Joker for the DC Universe series of movies that could really play well is that, um, I'll say, face-removed Joker from the new 52. Um, I think that storyline is incredible. The um, the Death of the Family storyline was a great follow-up to the classic um, Death in the Family storyline. And it's hard to follow up a storyline like that. Um, I also think that that storyline brings in a lot of other characters in the Bat family and could be a unique thing to see in the big screen because we haven't seen, say, Batwing or Nightwing um, or Batgirl show up in a um, Batman movie. And that would be a great way to do it. Um, and especially following up the long Halloween where we see where we could possibly see multiple villains like has been hypothesized. Um, so I, I think that those books are massively undervalued. And it, Brian, when you and I were originally buying up this series, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013, we never thought these books would reach the lows that kind of that they're at right now. And some of those variants, as you mentioned, some of the second prints of some of those books are incredibly cheap compared to where they were. And then there's some good first appearances beyond that. Um, two that come to mind are Spoiler, um, Stephanie Brown's new um, moniker um, with, I think, issue number what's it, 26. Um, uh, Duke Thomas with issue number 21. Those are books where I think there's a lot of meat left on the bone there. Um, Duke Thomas, I think, is a character, again, created by Scott Snyder that he was very passionate about. Kind of a common sense, cool character. Like Batman is the Dark Knight. He operates at night. Um Duke Thomas becomes like essentially the Batman by day as the signal. Um, and he patrols Gotham City during the day. I think there's there's definitely stuff they could do there with that character. Um, and these all of these appearances have become depressed in value compared to where they were. So all of those books are, are books to keep your eye out for. If you can see them cheap, now's the time to grab them. And yeah, they're cold. There's no doubt. But if you're buying books that are hot, you're going to have a hard time making money. And if you're here to make money, you got to be looking at these cold lists for buying opportunities. And there's plenty of them in the Batman world. And you know what, Brian? I think at this point I'm bullish on these Robert Pattinson movies. Um, I think we've talked about them enough. I'm starting to get excited about them. Right, and that's a great pick from Brian McClay. And make sure you guys check out Brian McClay on the CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside podcast live on their YouTube channel every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to roll into the next cold pick, and it comes from CoverTunes author Mike Morello. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's CoverTunes with my cold pick for the week. And this week I'm going with kind of a surprising one, which is Runaways books, um, especially this number one. Um, a beautiful book, uh, really a great cover, and one that you couldn't have gotten for less than $100 before the show started a couple of years ago. Um, but now you can get copies for $30, $35 in decent shape, which is sort of surprising to me considering they're about to launch the third season of the show in December. So the show is clearly good enough and popular enough to warrant attention, but for whatever reason the books have fallen off, um, and I'm not really sure why. This is still a beautiful cover. There's tons of beautiful covers, and it's a great story all the way through that first run. Um, then there's the two uh, additional runs after that from sort of the, the, older, uh, the older sets, and now you have the current run that's still going now. So it still seems like a popular story arc, but for whatever reason, 
the books just uh, have fallen off in value. Um, so they're cold. This is a book that I would want regardless uh, of whether the show is doing well or not. And uh, even with uh, the show doing well, it still seems not to be affecting the values very, very much. Which may be an overall warning to television spec in general. Um, but uh, without going too far into that, I think just as far as this title goes, this is, uh, this is a cold one from a comic book perspective. So that's my cold pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one. So we're talking Runaways with Mike Morello, and that's exactly what this pick did. Just ran away right down the cold list. No doubt these books have cooled off. They're really hot, especially around that option news. Hulu, I think Hulu's still finding its groove with the Fox merger. Disney took over more ownership of Hulu, right, from that deal? Right, right. So I think they're now the majority owners of Hulu. Right. So I think that right now is the reason that's kind of hurt it with why you're seeing some of those prices drop. I don't know. I'm not a huge Runaways fan of the comic or the TV show, but I'll let you talk about this, Jack. Yeah, I had never read the comic. It was one of those classic comics that I always kind of wanted to read, but I didn't get around to. Um, and I watched the first season of the show. I got to tell you, it's fantastic. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to watch it, if you're already paying for Hulu especially, check it out. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting story. You're talking about some kids who realize, oh, my God, my parents are villains. And then how do you handle that? Um, and they, they end up standing up and running away. So the title, you know, is kind of self-explanatory. And um, obviously, there are all kinds of things ensue. You end up finding out, wait, my parents have powers. I have powers. Um, and these characters kind of have to kind of learn how to use their powers on their own. And um, I think you hit the nail on the head talking about Hulu and the fact that, you know, it, it hasn't necessarily been a platform where it's been synonymous with, like, their own properties. So a lot of people haven't seen it. But we know that a lot of new Marvel shows are coming to Hulu. Howard the Duck... Uh, and the the Adventures in the Fear, Spirits of Vengeance uh, mo uh, TV shows. And I think the more Marvel stuff that ends up landing on Hulu, the more Hulu is going to be like required streaming for most comic book fans. And what's inevitably going to end up happening is they're going to go back and check out Runaways. And what they're going to find out is you're getting an extremely high quality entertaining show that follows the comic better than most comic book properties do. Um, and I think that that is going to hook people in. So we may see some like late breaking success for the Runaways. Also, the Runaways have a lot going on on the publishing side right now with uh, Runaways number 24 leading to Runaways number 25 from the current run. We end up realizing that this teaser that Marvel's been putting out about Doc Justice and the J Team, well, the J Team is the Runaways. And um, they kind of get their like their final form, their adult team that they're putting together. We don't know yet who Doc Justice is, but. You know, when Marvel put the original teaser out about Doc Justice and the J-Team, they compared them to the Avengers and the Defenders. They called it Marvel's next great superhero team. So, again, that's not my comparison. That's not Brian's comparison. That's what Marvel's putting out there. And, yeah, they're trying to sell comic books, but they're aware of how big of a comparison that is. So for them to put that out there, I am bullish that something is going to happen. So because of that, I think Runaways number one. I think is a good piece of spec. I think Runaways 24 and the upcoming issue number 25 from the new series are good spec. And I think um, probably several of the back issues from the first uh, volume of Runaways are probably solid spec. So keep an eye out for that stuff. Um, I think a lot of this stuff is cyclical and will come back around. And yeah, they're on their way to season three. So people are enjoying the show. Somebody's watching the show. Um, and it may be more of those non-comic book fans, but that's what it takes to spike an issue. So pay attention to that. I think that there's some buying opportunity here. Yeah. Could be different. Could be on free form. <laughs> yeah. Like cloak and dagger. That's a, that's another, another show. That's a great show, but people just aren't watching. What's up everybody. It's Peter Renna again, back with my cold pick for this week and bear with me, but my cold picks, uh, out a little, a little bit out of left field. I'm going to go with. Modoc. That's right. So he's supposed to have an animated series on Hulu coming up at some point. It's supposed to be adult oriented. I'm imagining something more in like the Venture Brothers vein or uh, maybe something like Archer. At least that's what I'm hoping for. Patton Oswalt's involved. So I'm uh, hoping for the best and think it could be actually pretty good. Now his books and, and as a character he doesn't do very much. I mean you can look for that Tales of Suspense 93 which is just like his voice or Tales of Suspense 94 which is his first full appearance. But I don't think we're going to get the 616 Modoc in that animated series. If they're doing something more adult I think it's going to be the uh, newer version of was in this uh, Modoc Assassin, and that 
is a, a Modoc from uh, Earth 11131. And uh, that's a 1 in 25 of that series. It's like a five issue run. That 1 in 25, I think I paid five bucks on eBay for. You can get one five to ten bucks pretty easily. They're not hard to find. And for a 1 in 25, that's not a big investment. And I just kind of like the cover. There's a, a couple of good covers, and the art on it is a pretty uh, anime style. I kind of dig it. But uh, hey, who knows? It's not a big buying. It's cold. Nobody's looking at them. But maybe down the line, if that animated series takes off and that's the Modoc that they actually go with, then uh, maybe it'll do something. Maybe make you a few bucks. So who knows? Anyway, my cold pick this week is Modoc. So there we got it, Peter talking Modoc, and as far as I know, it's always been cold. I did enjoy him with the Marvel vs. Capcom games, but either way, what do you think about this, Jack? Well, yeah, this is definitely a character that's really never been on anyone's radar, per se. I like Peter's thought that it's going to be more the modern version of the character that could pop off, because we're going to see essentially a comedy property. Um, this is, to me, I think, like he mentioned, it more of in the vein of like an Adult Swim type thing. And that's a great thing about like comic books and comic book cinema properties is there's a little something for everybody. So we've got like we've got the romance stuff, the family stuff, action, adventure, horror, suspense. And now we're getting something that's kind of tongue in cheek uh, comedy similar to what we're going to see, I think, with Howard the Duck. And, um, you know, what will that do for the comics? We don't know. But no one right now is searching for these books. No one out there is, you know, typing the character into those Google searches. And because of that, I think there's opportunity here. Um, if you're able to pick up those 125 incentives like uh, Peter showed in his video, um, absolutely, I think there's there's room to grow. That's actually an Electra Assassin um, uh, homage cover right there. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about a 1 in 25 – uh, variant for one fifth of ratio, you certainly have the ability to grow on that pricing, and that's pretty common of what we see from from the character. And just there's not a lot of interest um, there at this moment. But again, that's the buying cycle. This this was announced. There's a maybe a short spike, but this got announced along with say two or three other properties, and you know those properties got more attention. And as we get closer to the actual release of the show, I'm a big Patton Oswalt fan. The guy's hilarious. Um, so I am interested to see what they're going to do with it. And I think, you know, if you're already subscribed to Hulu, you're going to check it out. And if not, I think that that Ghost Rider show is going to bring a lot of people in um, and, and they'll, they'll check out some of the other properties. So it's, it's you know, a long shot, but it's cheap. And it belongs in the cold list because it's cold. And like you mentioned, it's kind of always been cold. But... It has a fighting chance because there's a show coming, which is more than we can say for a lot of characters. Right. <clears throat> Patton Oswald loved him in Unjustified. Loved him in S.H.I.E.L.D. He's also done some great voiceover work. I'm a Disney fan. He did do the voice of Remy in Ratatouille. But either way, and we also mentioned that this was going to be a possible Hulu show. A um, little fun fact or a secret fact. I don't know. If you guys have Sprint cell service and you're not aware... A lot of times you can get Hulu for free through Sprint. So that's just something to look into if you guys do have Sprint cell service. Yeah, this is a little, little cell phone bolo right there. <laughs> yeah. That way, yeah. Turned, got Mike Morello onto it. He had no idea. And he's like super stoked. So, And thanks, Peter, to that pick. And with that, that's going to give us our hot and cold list for this week. So we have a pretty good list. A little quick summary. We had... Villain Spec, we had Jenny Friesen, we had Long Halloween, Living Tribunal, and Absolute Carnage as our hot picks, and we had Tom King, Runaways, Batman New 52, and Modoc as the cold picks this week. What do you think of the list, Jack? I really like this list. Um, you know, I think it's a prime example of why we do this show. Um, a lot of these picks aren't going to end up on, say, the Hot 10 or anyone's Top 10. Um, but that's that's the beauty of this show is it gives a broader view of the market. Um, you know, a lot of times with those lists, some of those books kind of have already spiked. And even if we're talking about hot, we're talking about trends, we're talking about things moving upwards towards that. Um, and it gives you buying opportunities, I think, on both sides of the list, both hot and cold. And there's not enough talk about these cold trends uh, in the secondary market. A lot of people, they don't like to admit what, what books kind of are on the way down and maybe missed speculation opportunities or books that you're holding that now maybe you wish you had moved on from in, in advance. So that's why I like this show. I think it's a good, diverse group of picks. And um, again, a lot of buying opportunities on both sides. So um, I like this list. And um, it's again, it's why I like this show. 
Right. So also let us know in the comments, what are your hot and cold picks for this week? Definitely. And make sure you guys head over to cbsiswag.com to get those hoodies and those beanies, t-shirts. Use that code HOTCOLD10, get you 10% off your order. And tomorrow night, we have the CBSI Bolo Show, where we're going over first appearances, reader buzz, and variant buzz for all the new comics that came out today. We're going to talk about those tomorrow night. What else do we have, Jack? Well, yeah, and I'll tell you straight up, that's one of the best variant lists we've seen in a long time. That variant list is stacked, especially the incentives. But I think what you're talking about is our Friday night show. We're talking about the last call show, the pre-FOC show, the most controversial YouTube comic book show that I think has come on the scene in some time. Again, some of the speculators hate it. But you and the Simple Men's Comics family have let us know that you love it and you appreciate it. So we're not planning on stopping anytime soon. We are talking about comics that are still available to order. And you're getting that last call to get those orders in before that final order cutoff date. When you can get those copies locked in, whether it's at your LCS, whether it's at an online comic shop, um, or wherever you buy your comics from. This list isn't just the top 10, say, speculation picks from FOC. This is Brian and I's favorite 10 books that we're seeing on the list. This is, these are books that um, we're giving you an idea of when we look at an FOC list, what do we see? Some of them are going to be books we're interested in reading, which, of course, we've shown you on this channel how reader buzz can lead to speculation uh, prosperity. But also, you know, some of them may be based on uh, variant spec or based on just cool cover art. Or based on, um, you know, tr a leading solicitation. And when we're reading the solicitation, we see that something may be coming. So we are trying to pass on the knowledge that we've gained through all of these years um, in speculation, in collecting. And we're trying to pass it on to the Simmons Comics community. Um, we know there's a lot of you out there who are newer collectors, newer speculators. Um, and we're trying to help you and even just learn the FOC concept. Um, so, again... From the time that that show airs to Monday, that following Monday at 10 p.m. Eastern time, that is the end of that final order cutoff window. And these are books that release 23 days after that final order cutoff. And you know, it's your last opportunity to get those orders in. So that's why we call it the last call. Right. Call it the last call show. But we could also call it the IDGAF show. But either way. That's Friday nights, 9 p.m. when that premieres. I want to thank each and every one of you guys for watching this show with us tonight. If you watch on the replay, thank you as well. And if you're listening to the audio version on the podcast, Simple Man's Comics Podcast, thank you so much as well. And with that being said, we will wish you guys good night.